Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Film Courage live stream. We have the honor of having writer, teacher, and podcast host of Drinks with Tony, Mr. Tony Duchesne, live and in person to instruct us, do some live Q&A, and share a couple of writing exercises with us. Tony, it's great to have you here. Welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah, likewise. And especially for those of you not in L.A., we have a light drizzle here on the mean streets of Los Angeles, and we know Angelinos do not like to go anywhere in the rain. So we appreciate you braving the storm, Tony. My, my Harley with the monkey bars works <laughs> fine in the rain. Good, good. All right. Well, let's dive right in. Um, I guess we'll start with what makes a great scene. Yeah, that's – and the scene work is interesting because in when we talk about scene work, all we really need is a character – or we need more than one character, but the character needs conflict. So we want to keep our characters in as much conflict as possible. And there's a film I always bring up to the, uh, my students who, and I make them watch it over and over again because it's, it, Little Miss Sunshine carries the torch of scene by scene of hitting conflict, shifting power dynamics, which is also another word for shifting status. Um, I feel like that comes up more in TV shows and TV scripts, the shifts of status. And it's so powerful that when we see it in a movie, um, it, it's, it's pretty cool. So when I'm rewriting a scene, I go over who has status in the scene. And then is there a way to play with it? So I'll do an example of a cop interrogating a, a suspect. So there's a cop and he's interrogating a suspect. There it is cop interrogating a suspect and the cop has high status and the suspect is in handcuffs the suspect may even be crying and the suspect has low status so when you're watching a scene think about power dynamics and think about status because that's what actors are thinking about and that's what writers are thinking about when they're writing and actors are thinking about that when they're playing together but we can shift we can shift that dynamic because in the, so let's say in the same scene, the cop has information, the suspect has information that the cop wants. So then the cop realizes this, and maybe the suspect smiles, and the cop slams his fists on the table, and he's upset as the suspect is not giving him this information. And all of a sudden, the suspect is higher status, and the cop is lower status. The cop wants something, from the suspect and needs something from the suspect and the suspect isn't giving it up. So when you're watching films, keep an eye out on the, on the status and power dynamics and watch how the protagonists can go in and out of high status and low status in scenes. Like in a, here's the example of um, Little Miss Sunshine when we're introduced to Richard. Richard is, Richard is talking about his life coaching, his, I forget what it's like five principles for being the amazing man you are meant to be. And he's commanding the stage as he's, you know, eyeing the crowd and going over his presentation. And then the camera turns around and it shows us how many people are in the audience. There's like maybe 10 and he gets a tepid applause. <laughs> so the director, the director gave us a power dynamic shift. We thought we were seeing a very high status person almost talking to a stadium of people. And then we realize he's low status and it's practically a conference room and no one really cares what he's saying. So um, it's, it's a lot of fun and that's, and, that, and that's when Richard goes back down below status. Refuse to lose, <laughs> that's what it is. Right. The nine concepts. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of Little Miss Sunshine, of all characters in the film, who has the, the biggest sort of status shift? Yeah, the, well, our kid with the, the character with that has the most arc is Richard, the dad, because <clears throat> and when we look at Little Miss Sunshine, Richard is the protagonist um, because he's the one that needs to take the journey and to learn. So when we get to Act 3, he has the showdown with himself to finally get out of this facade that he's creating as a you know, guy with a master plan and everyone needs to succeed. And he makes a fool of himself at the end with his daughter, which just, it, it, that scene always um, really gives me chills when I watch it. But um, 
but his his he's trying to get high status the whole time. When he um, when he gets into his low status and kind of saves his daughter from having embarrassment alone, that's when he has challenged himself and he has won because he's become. He's lost his status, but he's become the father he's supposed to be for the family. And the whole family comes together when dad kind of realizes that. Wait a second. I need to save my daughter. That's beautiful. And just real quick, which character has the least arc? You know, Tony Collette's character, the wife, really has it. She feels like a placeholder. And I don't know if in early rewrites, if she had an arc, because a lot of these characters have arcs. Um, there's Dwayne, who has a, you know, that, yeah, it's a great ensemble mm -hmm. photo. Uh, the father has an arc. I mean, he's a junkie and then he dies. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and I don't, and then Little Miss, and the, the young girl who plays Little Miss Sunch, uh, little, little going to the beauty contest, she doesn't have much of an arc either. She's kind of like a placeholder. Um, mm -hmm. So there's there's a lot of fun happening, um, I think, between Dwayne and the brother um, through a lot of the film. And that might be, they may be hitting the philosophical points of what the writer was intending to kind of give the moral of the story throughout. I'm just mm -hmm. coming off a of memory. I haven't watched it in about a year because that's my first quarter students we have to watch it over and over and over again. it's so worth it yeah i want to go back to it it's been a while yeah. thank you yes yeah. what are storytelling cheats and and which are some that are fun to use storytelling cheats i'm glad you asked because i have some notes <laughs> oh great okay <laughs> um if you want to like feeling sympathy for a character some ways to get right to feeling sympathetic, um, and and Blake Snyder wrote the book Save the Cat. So there, so there's that's a way to get sympathy immediately. Immediately, save the cat. Um, but let here's another example. Let's say a mom's just trying to clean the house before her in-laws arrive. Have her step on a Lego. Have her have her step on like a tack or a nail. Um, when we when we when we do something with the palm of the hand, when we cut the palm of the hand or the bottom of the foot, as we're watching it, we've all experienced that pain, especially on the foot. The bottom of the foot hurts so bad. Mm -hmm. And it immediately gives us an emotional response where we're like, we've been there. We've done that. So that's an element to add to the scene. If we look at Minority Report, um, uh, in Minority Report, everyone is scanned by their eyeballs. And so when Tom Cruise is on the run and he's wanted for the future murder, he has to get rid of his eyeballs. It, it's, I mean, it, it, just that idea alone brings a massive conflict. And then, and so think about what you can do with the eyeballs. Can you touch the eye? Can you poke the eye? What, I, through that whole operation scene of Minority Report with Tom Cruise, it, we're, we're like losing our minds. Sure. Mm -hmm. And then if we go back to uh, Little Miss Sunshine, it's the there's a lovely thing that the writer does, which is he gives Dwayne the vow of silence. Um, Dwayne didn't have to have that vow. I don't know what draft of the script where the writer went, you know what? Because uh, the, the writer of the script in early drafts could have just had Dwayne upset and added his parents, and it would have been fine. But he has a vow of silence and it escalates his tragedy. So when he finds out he's colorblind and he can't become a pilot, I think he wants to be a pilot. You can't be a pilot when you're colorblind. When that plot point happens, that's the first time he speaks. And when he speaks after he hasn't been speaking of throughout the whole film, we pay immediate attention. So it's like it's symbolic on so many levels. And the other thing about Little Miss Sunshine is the VW van situation. Uh, just make 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 the VW van only start in second gear. <laughs> what, what a fantastic story device because it makes it um, it makes the family push the van and they all have to jump in the van. So there's danger involved. There's the family just being disgusted. They have to do this and. Um, it brings a and, and it's a device that brings us to the very end of the film. It's a device because they hate working together when this happens. It's 
drudgery through the film. When they've come together in the last scene as they push the van through the parking lot, they're, they're pushing the van as a family. All of a sudden, we see them as they, they've all kind of been reborn into becoming a family. And so watching them push the van is a whole new experience for us and them. And then uh, another one is Richard in Little Miss Sunshine again. Richard, who uh, at the beginning of the film attempted suicide. Uh, he, they have his bandages on his wrist through the whole film. So, you know, props department, I believe, would be the ones who do that. And it's just a little piece of cloth on his on his wrist. But it can, but it's it's continuing to remind us where he came from. So we don't so we don't lose track of who he is and why he's there. Mm -hmm. um, those are little things. So if you just think of a prop, think of a wardrobe, but they can add the character that can symbolize something that's uh, larger for the, for the audience. That's great. And you also use uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Listen, so oh, wait, real I, quick. we're getting a note. Um, yeah, it was just, we have people all over oh, the world wonderful. there. So wonderful. Let's, let's Hello. Welcome. Up there. Thank you for joining us. Nice. Wes Craven hanging in the desert in Phoenix. Wes Craven. Wes Craven, nice. I love that guy. <laughs> Tomar or Tomer? Hello from Israel. Hello. Very nice. Uh, Eliz, hello from Nigeria. Hello, Eliz. I hope I'm saying people's names right. Please forgive me if if I've mispronounced them. Uh, Ed Husker, great question. Hello, Ed. How to write a villain protagonist? Yeah, that's a good question. Okay. Is there a villain? In uh, Little Miss Sunshine? Well, with Little Miss Sunshine, Richard is his own antagonist. Okay. So he needs to, and that's when he has his, that's the, and we get the cue to when he has his, um, <clears throat> we get the cue to who the antagonist is when we look at the Act 3 showdown. And the showdown is with Richard um, coming, in, coming into uh, his own with his family. Um, Yes, so he's his own antagonist. As far as a villain protagonist, I, what, what do they call that? Anti-heroes now, which we have great examples of in Breaking Bad, um, where they are kind of villains to essentially the morality of the universe that's created, yet we're pulling for them in some way. And, and, and that's another example of a story cheat because we're pulling... And I got Brian Cranston plays him. I can't remember his character. Oh, Walter White. Walter White. Yeah. But um, we we're brought in to sympathize with him because he has cancer and he's going to die. He wants to take care of his family, and that's the empathy that we have. So then we're on board, and then he starts to do all these terrible things. So we're still kind of on board, um, and that's that's like a great example of kind of the anti-hero, um, where he is a villain in this world of bad things happen, but we're also, he's the protagonist of the show. Right. And I believe too, there's the scene where he and his son or the family, they go to buy jeans and, and then there's also the car wash scene. And so there's all these little glimmers right. where you see like, wow, this guy's really, I don't know if I could hold it together as well as this guy is. He's, <laughs> yeah. he's going to crack at some point. Yeah. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, just boom, there we go. I don't know how many seasons it was. What a beautiful franchise, though. And then we got Better Call Saul out of that. Right, right. So many amazing things. Oh, and we have Alvin in Phoenix. Wow, big Phoenix following here. Hello, Alvin. Very nice. Um, any other questions so far? Okay, here. Oh, hey, Dan Calvisi, Story Maps. Yay, woo, woo. Hey, guys, it's Dan from San Pedro. Okay, so, yeah, he's in the, he's in the chat. Uh, and then we have someone from New Jersey, World Empire. Hello. Watch my legacy of B. Okay. Sounds good. And La, La Patria Grande as Primero. Or Timo Diaz from Mexico. Hello. I'm learning Hello. Spanish. Oh, I'm very trying nice. to relearn Spanish. And don't try to make me pronounce all of that because I will ruin <laughs> everything. <laughs> okay. Great. Love it. Um, Hello, an H man. Hello. What makes a good tragedy? Hmm. I, you know, it's That's a good question. yeah, it's a great question. Mm -hmm. it's, it's even with uh, what are those two drama figures, the comedy and the tragedy, right? Um, mm -hmm. The masks. Yeah, and it's the I, 
it's the tragedy and comedy are just such in line with each other. And even in a comedy, when we watch a good comedy, um, the protagonist is usually in the utter um, tragedy of their condition. So they're kind of the, they're, they're taking in the, the tragedy for us while we laugh as they get to this place. So more tragedy in a comedy, the funnier. And the shift to uh, tragedy is just staying in the tragedy. I guess, I guess if you think about comedy and tragedy, like it's both tragic. There's an old film that Woody Allen did called Melinda and Melinda, um, where he, it was the same characters, but one story was the comedy and one story was the tragedy. And it was the exact same dialogue. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I, Will Ferrell was in it. And this is just coming to my uh, brain synopsis. And that's as far as I remember. <laughs> What about in Ferris Bueller's Day Off? I know we were going to talk about that. Is there tragedy? Oh, there's lovely tragedy. <laughs> okay. I could talk about Ferris Bueller for a week. Oh, hold on. Okay, we're getting we're getting notes from the producer here, keeping me on track. That's good. We want to make sure to get to everyone's questions. We're this is uh, we're still uh, in our infancy with all of this. Hello, R.C. Scott. Fire! 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 Yeah. That's pretty awesome. Vishal, hi from Sydney. All Hello. Right. Wow, we've got a great international audience. Uh, currently studying film at Full Sail. Woo woo! Love the amazing work. Great school. Thank you. Apple Tree 14. Hi from Germany. Storlock. Hello, Hello. Storlock. Hello there. I plan to visit your country next year. Oh, Curtis W. Jackson. Hello, I'm from Long Island. Nice. Hello, Curtis. Against All Odds Films. Hello from Boston. Boston. Love Boston. Nice. And Tom Skolosko. Hello. Tom from Latvia. Ooh, very cool. Hello. Very cool. Wow. This is a great mix here. I love it. Hello from New Mexico. Nice. Video Speaking gamer. of Breaking Bad. <laughs> right. Video Gamer 65. Sangari. Hello. Another great question. Why write and try to get my work out there if the chances of it being optioned or even read? is extremely slim in the real world? Well, that's a good question. I've got the answer to that. Because <laughs> so. uh, you're right. It may never get read. There, it may not be off, or it might not be option. It might not get out. But what I've learned through tons of failure and a couple of kind of successes is to embrace the process. And not only embrace the process, just realize that you're a writer, so you wake up every day as a writer. And I, I, someone asked me, they're like, oh, how do you get your inspiration? I'm like, inspiration, what? No, <laughs> I just write. It's I have a routine. I have these three structural things that I do, and then I get to my work, and it's just, a, and I do it every day. And the beauty of that is the process. So nobody can take the process of writing away from you. So you just keep crafting a story, crafting a story. And even when um, even when good things happen, like yeah, I was when we had our premiere of uh, Confessions of a Teenage Jesus Jerk, and I, yeah, I got to do Q and A, and it was just it was such an uplifting point. And then the next day, I was depressed, and I was like, "Oh, that's the end of that." But I learned a valuable lesson there. No, it's not the end of that. It's tomorrow. I get to work on the other thing I'm working on, the next thing. So more important than the outcome is the process and you have to love the process. So if you, you just, and you have to love storytelling. It's just, it's, if it's your religion, you're going to show up every day to it. And um, whether there's an outcome or not. And then uh, in, in like when it, like playing the lottery, you're going to be in it to win it. Right. So in order to write, in order to have stuff to show people, you have to have a lot of writing to show people that's finished. And, that and you may be put in a good position more often than not where people go, oh, send me what you have. And if you have a lot of stuff because you've been working hard for a long time, you have things to show them. And that's where the doors open um, when there's things to show them. I hope, I hope that helps your question. But the real world is being at your desk writing every day, which is such a, a luxury and a cool thing to do in life. 
I, it's my favorite thing to do. So. And you write in coffee shops a lot too, don't you, Tony? Yeah, I do a lot of handwriting in coffee shops. I, I'm, I'm the guy that never brings a laptop. <laughs> and I also really hate doing, I, we're in LA, so I hate writing screenplays in coffee shops. I write novels in coffee shops. And then if I'm if I'm working on a screenplay, I'll handwrite the screenplay at a coffee shop on a yellow pad and then bring it home and type it in. Um, that's my own weird quirk. But um, yeah, I just, I love the longhand and then I print out, like go home, type it up, keyboard it all in, print it all out, then bring the print out the next day. And sometimes the print out gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And before you know it, I have a binder that I'm doing rewrites on. It's uh, so whatever project that's happening, early stages is yellow pads, later stage, stages is binder. And going back to what Sangari is saying, did anybody say the same thing to you? Like, hey, Tony, there's so little chances of this. Why do it? What, why, why waste your time with this? Well, I, well, I mean, I kind of grew up in a religion where you weren't supposed to do anything but, you know, preach. So I, it, um, so that's a little weird because I was doing something that was so not what you were supposed to do. So I had to fight through that. Uh, people making fun of me for writing and trying to write. Um, sometimes that's good because sometimes pe I feel like people should tease people a little bit to see if the resolve is there. And if you can get past those people going, you can't write, what do you do? What do you think you are? You're writing, what are you, what are you, you're out of your mind. You can't be a writer. And then you get past them and, the, and it's almost like the, you, you walk through that first obstacle. You had the conflict. You walk through your own first obstacle and you're like, I'm writing. Hmm. I love it. I love it. Wow. Uh, okay, we have another another question. Oh, Curtis W. Jackson, I live in Bayshore. Okay, Bayshore, very cool. And Vlad Voodoo, I'm in uh, Romania. Bucharest. Bucharest. I'm hoping to visit there next fall. So oh, I'll, wow. I'll see you. I'll see you there, Vlad. What a great like internet. Hi, uh, C. Gustav. Hi from L.A. Nice. Talk about subtext. <laughs> very nice. I hope you're braving the rain. A uh, Caleb Drew. Uh, bring some knowledge. Canada, Canada, sorry, is in the house. Very cool. Hello, Kayla. Doreen Zimmerman. Hello from Amish Paradise, aka uh, Pennsylvania Dutch country. Awesome. And hi, Val Dion Parker. Hello, this is Val from Virginia, and I so appreciate the film education via Film Courage. Hello, Val. We appreciate you. Thank you for watching. And, oh, Quintil Pompey, hello, a recent graduate of LA Film School. I love Film Courage. Yes, we've seen you many times in the comments. Thank you. I love seeing you here. And I hope I'm saying your name right. I'm sorry if I've mispronounced anybody here. Um, and here we go, Amelia Films. Hello. What makes a character memorable, especially villains? That's a good one. I like, like that. that question. Mm -hmm. it, sometimes the villain needs to be more interesting than the protagonist because the more the protagonist goes through their journey and the more interesting the villain is, the more the protagonist has to go through the obstacles of this interesting and powerful villain. So even though the, the villain is the antagonist, they are the protagonists of their story. So yeah, Batman is such, Batman is such a great... Um, example of that because because batman yeah okay he's kind of interesting but the villains are always more interesting than batman is that's, that's, as far as the tv series i don't know what the other stuff is no i'm kidding um <laughs> but but, it, I, uh, but it's but this, but things like batman and spider-man they they hold the center of the story and then those villains just make those villains pop give them the weirdest quirks in the world um Give them, you don't even need to write, well, I feel like you need to write the backstory of everything and write, just and get, know your character inside and out. But when you're putting it to script or you're putting it to a novel, you don't need to have that all in there. You just write them from knowing what their background is, from knowing why they are so messed up in the head and have this twisted angle on life. And it's, the villains are beautiful. So just make sure that, um, and kind of make them lovable too. I mean, you I, if you're working on a character for, you know, say a couple of years, you really got to like, you almost have to love your character, even if they're the jerks of the film, you have to understand that empathy because in order to in order to write and keep the process going, we have to love our characters. If we're not coming to 
the morning and writing with love, that's kind of a sad place to be. I mean, come come with you know self-destructive hate and go, how am I gonna do this? This is never gonna work. Uh, but at the same time, when it comes to our characters, we love them because we wanna take them on the most interesting journey that we can put them through. Right, and do you think um, we like uh, characters that are more self-destructive rather than those that are uh, destructive toward others? Because maybe we can relate or... Yeah, yeah, we can relate. And it's, yeah, I, I think you're right. The the, the self-destructive ones, I feel like, I mean, I really hope everyone has some self-sabotaging things they do to themselves <laughs> because I'm the king of it. So I immediately relate to that. Whereas uh, people who have out, you know, I, I think so, I think I, that's a good, that's a good uh, thought because as viewers, that's easier to connect with us when people are out when outright pushing out and hurting other people most of us don't do that and even when we're at our worst we won't hurt someone else we or you know i like i'll enclose and be really upset but sure. but it goes in it doesn't go out uh if it goes out too much there might be a sociopath type level thing, which is fun to watch so much fun to watch not fun to be right okay oh hello fellow citizen from australia hello and oh very nice eric five dollars thank you he has um what's your process of incorporating supporting characters predetermined or added as you go hmm, that's great for me it's added as i go um i will I write the, especially in first drafts, I'm writing the characters, I'm writing the story about as fast as my hand can write. And then, um, and then all of a sudden something will show up and a character shows up and something interesting. I, oh, wow, that's interesting. And then it's just characters start to take play, start to start to find their way in. And then some characters stay in and some characters leave. So the character kind of has to prove themselves. And other times characters may sound the same, so you can smash three characters into one character. So uh, I add as I go, but they're, you know, either or, because predetermined is someone who would work from an outline and kind of come with the struggle. They, they can come with the whole family tree of characters before writing a single word. And so that's where writers, uh, when they just kind of understand their process, and understanding the process is just continuing to show up to the page every day and going, oh, wait, I, I like the family tree of characters or I like uh, my friends call me a pantser because I, I do things by the seat of my pants. Um, so I just like to I just like to throw paint and then try to make it pretty later uh, by coming back to it day after day, which may not be the quickest way to get work done, but it's just the way that I personally do it. So you. So learning your process is the way to go. And have you written supporting characters and then said, you know what, I think this one has to go? Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> no, there's. I kill a lot of darlings, and um, I yeah, I I've had to kill a lot of darlings over this last year. In the, in the novel that I now have finished, but um, oh, great. yeah, but the uh, yeah, it hurts. You're like, oh man, but it's you know sometimes they upstage the. The journey or the upstage of the protagonist and it's all about serving the story serve serve your protagonist by creating that conflict that stays within the um, within the world that you've created very nice. uh, ed husker 473 has a um question how to make a wrath wrathful misanthropic character likable oh wow um that's that's interesting <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I don't know how likable you can get them, but it could go back to little story cheats that we were talking about earlier. If, you know, if we see them step on a Lego or we see them, you know, if we see them um, have a human moment, um, we'll probably be on board with them for that human moment. And that's just little story devices to put in there. Um, or we can even look in their background. We can see... Uh, we we can see that where where this where this comes from, and we may not ever want to be like this person, um, but we go oh wait okay we know and I think we all have enough evil inside of us that we try to keep down that uh, 
that we try to keep. <laughs> that sounds terrible. That, that we, we're all capable of evil, sure. but we just don't do it. And so when someone's doing it, we don't like it. But if they're doing it, they're also human. That that creates uh, maybe more of an, a, really, a handshake with, with the audience. And just goes, oh, yeah, I get people who might be able to go that, to that place. I never will. But, wow, fun watching you do it. Right, right. Oh, yeah, and seeing them have a human moment or maybe seeing that, that sort of wrathful person break down and then you realize that they're damaged and you can see the same in yourself. So, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, Andrea Ivy, hello. Hi. How do you write your truth? Write your truth. <laughs> Love it. We were talking about this uh, before we went on air, and um, it's something that I tell my students uh, every quarter is um, it's, it is what everything's been written. Right? It's like there, is, there are no new stories. Like people are, oh, we need original content. It's, in the end, um, there are like maybe shifts in how the story is told. What is original is you, the person you are. So me, who I am today, December 19th, 2023, is the collection of all my experiences, the collection of all my sorrows, the collection of all my joys, the collection of so much. And so I, if I approach a story where we all say we have um, 60 bullet point outline and the characters named and everything happens, we're all, I will write it differently than somebody else because this is where I am at this point in my history. and. Other people are at different points and has, have had different things happen to them. So when you keep honest with yourself and who you are um, and understand that you are, take, you are writing from your angle on the human condition or your, your, your camera point of view of who we are, uh, everyone has a unique thumbprint on that. And that's, that's, the, uh, that's where the beauty of this is. That's where I love um, watching students uh, – watching their writing grow because you know even though i can put even though i can help them along it's them it's the, they're they're the ones it's extract extract what they need to, what they need to tell in their story that's that's the fun stuff i love it have you ever had a teacher tell you you know what tony i feel like this isn't your truth you got to go deeper or 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 no you, you've always kind of able to just pour it out on the page? Uh, no, I think early on I had teachers that were, uh, and one of my early teachers uh, over 20 years ago uh, when I first started taking screenwriting workshops, uh, he pulled me aside and he said, Tony, you're a talented writer and um, you're very funny and your scenes suck. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we, would do, we would do table reads and he's like, every table read when you bring in the scene, everyone is laughing. He's like, and that's great, but your scene, your, your, your scenes just aren't working. Um, and so I had to learn, oh, okay, now what makes a scene? What makes a scene is conflict, is power dynamics. It's, and it took me years to kind of put all that together. And go, okay, cool. And I'm sure, you know, and then also enjoying that scene suck on early drafts or second, third drafts, embracing that and then knowing that you can come back and craft because they say writing is rewriting. It's just about crafting, crafting. Beautiful. Oh, we have a question from Spruce. Hello from Wisconsin. Um, how should I approach short form storytelling? Is it a different process to feature length? Oh, yeah. I love Wisconsin. I've, I've visited La Crosse before. Oh, great. great breweries. Um, approaching short films that it's, Short films, I feel like, can get away with more than feature-length films. I love short films that can have a surrealistic um, aspect to them that we may not see exactly where everyone comes from or where they're going. Uh, and But it, we're also investing less time in them as a viewer. So a solid 15-minute film might be a beautiful, serene, Thing or you know a couple bullet points are uh, there, and it's fun to play with that. I think there's less stakes involved with um, 
putting together the you know writing crewing up and all that uh when when it comes to the feature really i mean and in short you need a three-act structure but then the feature film world definitely need a three-act structure because we have all been um kind of conditioned as audience members we've watched films and all films have three-act structures and you can hit the bullet points of you know status quo inciting incident and the first act uh characters on their journey and so even though we don't people who aren't screenwriters who aren't interested in the behind the scenes they know when a film is not hitting those points because they'll be like oh that film's kind of weird i didn't like it that much usually it's because they didn't hit the points um yeah, so that's, I mean, that's the difference of a, of a feature. And, and a feature is just so much harder to write. How should you approach short to, short to film? With joy and fun and vigor. <laughs> and then a feature film, you're going to war. <laughs> well, I know with your book, uh, Confessions of a Teenage Jesus Jerk, you turned it into a film? Yes. Did you ever think about doing a short, or did you do no. that? Oh, you didn't, okay. Uh, and that was the insatiable, delusional lunatic in me when I was writing the book, even before I, I didn't know if anyone was ever going to publish it, that I already knew it was a film, too. Um, and I never saw it anything other than a feature. Mm -hmm. um, but I did. I also didn't have, I, I wasn't directing that. Uh, so there was, so it was wonderful because it was out of my control and then Eric Stoltz's control as the director, uh, but I had to get it right on the page for it to, for him to work forward on it. Okay. Another question from respectable lady, respectable lady, love it. Uh, how do you know if your idea for a script is a good one? And she says, hello from Atlanta. Hello, Atlanta. Your, your idea is terrible. <laughs> it's, it's, um, I, I say that kind of to be funny, but I say that in all seriousness. Um, most people, uh, or especially people who don't write, they say, I have this idea for a film. And I'm like, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> and it's because it, it's, it may sound okay when you talk about it, but then you put it on the page. And then I ask people who have put this idea on the page. And I'm like, and what did you think? And they're like, it's terrible. And I'm like, yes, that is the place to be. Because an idea itself is not what anchors the story. The the What anchors the story is continuing to work through the idea, to adding characters, to the, the, it's all about character. It's all about putting the character through conflict, no matter what the idea is. And I get a kick out of bad ideas. I have so many bad ideas. And then I go, wait a second, that's a bad idea that I have to try. And then you just choose a bad idea and work on it for a year or two. And all of a sudden, and this is, this is, some, this is something that can happen, is when, you have, when you're working on something, all of a sudden, all these great ideas started carrying over here. They're not great ideas. Just write them down and put them aside and stay with your project because any idea can make a great film. So that's my, that's my advice on that. That's interesting. So in a sense, then, there are – every idea is bad, but then there are no bad ideas because if you're adding to them <laughs> – not to get too yes. you know, woo-woo about it, but then you're adding to them and you're putting little puzzle pieces in. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yes, it's, 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 I like how you say puzzle pieces because a good idea could just be a puzzle piece. And you look at it and go, oh, wait, this is nothing. You put the whole puzzle together and you're like, gorgeous. We have another question coming in of Christian Colson. Christian writes, where do you stand on plot versus character debate? I know that's a hot topic with writers. When writing, do you prefer to focus on fleshing out the plot or diving deep into character study? Ooh, I like that. Yeah, yeah. For me, the character is everything. Uh, some people start with plot. Some people start with character. They're, but they both need to be there. So they both need to show up. Um, we, we, with, without a plot, the character does nothing. It just kind of stands there and looks at you. Um, without a character but a great plot, there's empty space. So... Um, I feel like the character is more important than the plot, but the plot needs to be there. So they kind of, they, they both have to be together. I focus personally on diving into the character and who the character is. And I feel like maybe, uh, maybe even actors think about this too, because when they're working on their character, they're not thinking of the plot. They're thinking of where is this character coming from? In this scene, where is this character coming from? In another scene, 
So yes, there is a plot, but at the same time, that character, a strong character, can have, can bring us bring a plot that doesn't have a lot of plot elements to it. I'm trying to think of a film that is very light in plot. There's a lot of films that are light in plot, but the character just pops, and they're beautiful. If there's a huge plot and the character is not working, the whole movie dies because we're, the character is the face. The character is the, uh, the the face of the journey that we are, um, that, that we're going, hey, I'm on this journey with you. What was the first character that stood out for you, whether in a, a novel or film? Oh, good question. It just really resonated. Um, and here's a film, well, and I think I brought this up when I talked to you guys last time. Johnny Swade. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Tom DiCillo's <laughs> first movie. Brad Pitt's first role as a feature, as a as first role as a feature film actor. And um, that resonated with me when I was young a lot. Uh, and it's, yeah. And I've gotten to interview him about it. And uh, I, Hang them with question after question. He was interviewing for another film, and I'm like, you know what? Hi, can we just talk about Johnny Swade? Well, <laughs> oh, this is Brad Pitt. No, no, this is Tom DeChillo. Oh, okay. And he's just like, yeah, yeah, we could talk about that. I'm like, all right. So, oh, very cool. Um, yeah, it's uh, I, I haven't watched it lately, uh, but it meant a lot to me when I was younger. That's one character that really stood out. Um, yeah, it's when I think of the important ones when I was young, it was that one. I recently rewatched uh, Mormon Caller with um, Samantha Morton, and what a beautiful! I, I I just love that film so much. Maybe because it's about a guy. <laughs> this is gonna be dark, but a guy. The the beginning of the film is her boyfriend kills himself, and so immediately we're brought into the conflict. But he left a book for her to send to publishers. Mm. So she she decides to write her name as the author instead oh, of his, and then we see her just go through this maniac. And it's based on the book, and that might be why I also like it. Mm, have to check that out. Oh bonjour! Oh, oh bonjour! Oh uh, Matthew Regnard, hello from France. Love the content. Hello. I hope I'm saying your name right. Hello, bonjour. Uh, Indra. Dada Gupta, hello from Atlanta. Hello there. A lot of people from Atlanta. The second Atlanta. Hollywood right now, right? Right, hot Atlanta. Yeah. And Alvin E. Lawrence, hello, Alvin. Would love your thoughts. What's the first thing you would do if you were beginning to write characters for a series? Oh, that's a good one. That's a really good one because mm -hmm. a series has to carry seasons. So when you're when you're thinking about characters, you're also thinking about world building a lot more. And and thinking about okay, I can write the pilot, and also when I'm pitching, I have to know season one arc, season two arc, season three arc. Or if you're writing a sitcom, you have to know the world of where they have the um, what do you call it, the enclosed story of each episode, like a procedural too. A lot of procedurals sure. have their enclosed stories, and it's just like, and we wrap up. Oh boy, we got him this time, but wait till next week when we are not sure if we'll get him. Um, so yeah, it's, if you're beginning to write characters for a series, play with, play with the beauty of the form of the series. What's, what's the series about? The series has to have, so, the series has to have a tone unto itself that lasts for a very long time. And then in that, at that point, you can say a feature film is almost a short story and a series is a novel or a series of novels. And that's when the world of, is um, the world of is important in a film too, but really have fun with the world of where you're putting them. Even though even a TV show like Friends or like Seinfeld, you're putting Seinfeld on uh, his little, you know, in his apartment a lot. And Friends, they're all in the cafe. Uh, they all have their conflicts, um, and for for a lot of TV series, they are um, they are tied into the sets that are created. So. I guess on that note, think about keeping your locations as minimal as possible. How do you keep your locations as minimal as possible? So if you're working on film, I mean, if you're working on a TV series, they can shoot as much as possible on a soundstage before having to go out and do all the exteriors. Is there a series that did not uh, get picked up for a second term that you 
Lamental? Yes. Oh, great question. Freaks and Geeks. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Judd Apatow and Paul mm -hmm. Feig's uh, series. Um, and I got to interview Paul Feig after that. And um, well, I got to interview him for his book. And I asked him, I was like, what happens in season two? What were you guys planning on season two? And he told me that um, the lead character was going to be pregnant in season two, the, the girl. Um, I was like, oh, man. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, I know you're going nonstop, so maybe just have some water real quick. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sorry, we don't we don't need to work <laughs> trying so hard, by the way. We know that the writer's strike is over, and we don't want to – we're trying to go – Go easy on him here. Sorry. I, I love I love the set the the my the you you got the headphones and you're like dude I'm here with that frog. Man. <laughs> so we're just we're just giving uh, Tony a moment. Um, no, there's so many great questions that are coming oh, this in. This is so amazing. We're, we're, we're trying to get it. We're trying to get as many answered as we can. Here. Yeah. Thank you so much That's why we're here. to everyone. Uh, Art yeah. with Amar B question. When starting out as a content creator making film, is two sentence or shorts a good path to follow? Um, I don't I don't understand that question. Two, Two sentences, sentence four shorts. Short. Interesting. Uh, okay. we'll try the next you one. know, forgive me. I am not, I don't, maybe we could get clarification. Yeah. Sorry, we don't want to skip over I'm not. Question. I'm not hip to that yet. <laughs> so I would like to know, and then I want to know, and I'll have fun with it. Right, and we have a DW, hello, question. In your opinion, which character traits make Colonel Jessup, a few good men, such a polarizing and unforgettable villain. I yeah. just I just watched that film this last year and signed it to my students. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it's um it's it's his moral code is so stringent and his status is always high. Well, talk about status play. That court scene is one of the most beautiful court scenes to watch in the very end, where I think it's an eight-minute scene uh, where it's just like watching status shift from uh colonel jessup to the uh tom cruise's character back and forth mm -hmm. um that's it's a lot of status shifting but the what, what colonel jessup has as a as a trait that is very positive in humans is he has insatiable drive insatiable drive to do everything he can that he feels is right to protect everybody and even though it's utterly flawed from his from our point of view, it is not flawed from his point of view. And it's just mm. I feel like that it's there's just something about it. And, and it's just Jack Nicholson. <laughs> yeah, I think reading Colonel Jessup on the page and then watching Jack Nicholson be Colonel Jessup just so great. Right. And oh, third eye from our son, uh Freaks, hello, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, yes, I Freaks and geeks. that. Yeah, <laughs> I almost read it as Third Eye Blind. Sorry, great band by the way. Yeah, so thought I. Yes, I knew he'd say that. Okay, they somehow I, knew it. I, I looked at the demographic. <laughs> <laughs> Who would kids. watch Freaks and Geeks? <laughs> You're perfect for a focus group. Um, yeah. Ben Fox, hello from the UK. My brother and I are coming out to LA in January. We uh, have several stories and two feature screenplays. Where would one start in order to get a meeting or a pitch? Hmm. Yeah, welcome to Los Angeles. <laughs> and guess what? Even people in Los Angeles are asking that question. It's it it's. I moved to Los Angeles from San Francisco, and I just thought you just showed up and people threw money at you, and you gave them. You know, oh, here's my here's my brilliant words. Of course, thank you. I'll buy that house. Um, but what I've learned, even the big writers, like writers that I'm huge fans of, um, they are struggling to get pitch meetings and to and to put together uh, put to put things together too. Everyone's struggling. Even even A list writers are um, in the struggle. So I don't think I don't think just coming into Los Angeles and expecting to get any meetings is a great idea. Unfortunately. There's something about being in Los Angeles still that feels a little important, even though I'm not good at pitching. <laughs> um, I'm, or maybe I, I might be good at pitching. Maybe I just don't do it as much. I'll talk about that with my therapist tomorrow. <laughs> but um, but yeah, it's if if you if there's coming to Los Angeles for expectation of moving the career forward, um, 
it's that's cool. But come to Los Angeles with uh, trying to learn the culture of the city because the city is so much more than screenwriting. And then all of a sudden, you just kind of start to meet people who are in the industry. And you might meet them in different places that you would never think about instead of Chateau Marmont with your $19 <laughs> martini going, well, I'm going to sip this slow. This is an expensive martini. Is right. anyone here? Lana Turner might be sitting there. But in, in all seriousness, though, not to, to uh, you know, dissuade Ben and his brother from coming here, but if they don't have a meeting already set up, I like what you said, uh, to, to get the kind of feel of L.A. Yeah. It's important. Yeah, LA, and, you know, I'm from San Francisco, and we had our nose turned up to Los Angeles when I was young. And, <laughs> and it's, and it's um, and I came to L.A., and I was like, don't be that San Francisco guy. Right. And, and once I once I decided on that, it's like Los Angeles is a really beautiful city. It's amazing outside of the film industry, and you get just little pockets, and then all of a sudden you're in the beauty of the creativity of what's happening, whether it's in film or in theater. It's so much fun stuff. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and it moves fast too. So, oh, we have art with Amar B back. Clarification. Here we go. Two sentence horror stories are on Hulu and Netflix. They're horror stories told in a micro short format, maybe three to five minutes. Okay, great. Thank you for clarification. Yeah, that's new to me, and that sounds like a lot of fun. I will have to watch those. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I'll have to check that out too. I was not aware of those. Yeah. So that's interesting. Um, Ed Husker's back. Hello, Ed. Hello from oh Indonesia. Great. How do I make my characters more than just a caricature? Hmm. I like that. Yeah. Um, it's in, er, in early drafts, we're just, we're again, putting paint to the canvas and there, there'll, there'll be caricatures and they'll, they'll be cliche. And I, I, I talk to my students a lot where they're like, Oh, I'm so worried. This feels cliche or fabricated. And I'm like, don't worry. It is cliche and fabricated, but keep massaging it. And even then when you're, when we are working on conflict um, and we are fabricating conflict. But the it's we're storytellers, so we have to take the normal conflict of everyday life and smash it together to make it interesting. Because if we, so if I mean if if, if let's say I'm a character through my life and like my, like driving on the Los Angeles freeways, it's um that might be a story, a very boring story. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's uh but then again maybe. There's something in that where there could be a film from the point of view of a guy driving Los Angeles freeways. And with that is when we go to the craft and keep going, hey, that's a really dumb idea. Feel free to take that dumb idea. But it's it's something where, oh, wait, okay, this character can do this. This character can, can go there. It's showing up to the page every day. That's That's the main thing. Just show up, show up, show up. Maybe you're driving and you hear an NPR story. And then you actually forget where you're going. It's so interesting, and you want to write about it. And now your life's totally shifted course. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or you call the NPR station, and you go, I really like that story. And then all of a sudden, you're married to the person. Answering the phone? Yeah, yeah. Five oh, years, oh. It, it, two years later, you know, it's just, <laughs> right. can I get your number? That's we'll good, meet yeah. at this cafe. That's what happens in Los Angeles. Very true, very true. Uh, Laporte, hello from Britain. I'm writing my first TV series. I'm halfway through episode three of about six, and I'm really losing motivation to write. Ooh, that's a good question. How do you self-motivate during moments of self-doubt? Thank you. Yeah, I lose interest too in stuff. That's a great question. I love this question. So all this question says to me is you're a writer. <laughs> it's okay. it's um, <clears throat> we. The getting through the self-motivation and getting through the self-doubt is what writers do to get to their end. And that's why people find it so hard to write because you're going to hit that wall. And it's, it's almost like you just got to show up with that self-doubt. One thing I try to do, I'll work on a different project if I'm having a really hard time with the current, like if I'm halfway through a, a project, I'll do some short little writing thing that may never ever get published or, or maybe even write outside of what, with those characters of something else, um, just to kind of bring some freshness back to it. And then it just, and then you got to come back in and just feel like an imposter and feel like there's just no way 
uh, you're going to do anything right, but you continue to just plug away and ask questions. Well, where would it, where does this go here? And I'll even write the questions. I'll just be like, um, I'll have my characters ask me questions. I'll, I'll write their questions down and then I try to answer them. And that has got me out of some, uh, some stuck places as well. So it's, uh, just, I, when your question just proves you're a writer. So, and Prove it even more to get to episode six with all that self-doubt and that hard motivation to sit down with it every day. I love that. And, you know, sometimes it seems like if things are messy around us, maybe it's time to just kind of, like, clean them up and then make sure everything is, like, within its place and we can kind of get a new spark again. I don't know. That's it, yeah. It's declutter. You're right. The there, there's, de there's declutter, <laughs> and then there's repainting <laughs> to avoid. Oh, okay. Okay. So then some of it might be avoidance. All right. Maybe I'm giving that advice. No, you're it. not. That's actually – no, it, it, that is something to shake it up. We wanted that, that would, I would think that's shaking up our environment. You know, mm -hmm. shake up the environment in, in the morning, go to a park and write for a while and see if that, you know, works. It may not work. Maybe a very bad idea. And is that what helps you being in coffee shops because it's such a different environment every day? Um, yeah, and I, plus people irritate me. <laughs> so uh, in coffee shops, I get a little irritated. And then that I don't know what it is, and I never really put my finger on the why, but it just um, it, it's. I think I need to be vaguely irritated in order to be self motivated, Interesting. which is kind of great in society because she could be irritated with anything <laughs> sure sure especially la is very crowded so. yeah, yeah yeah hello from brazil hugs from brazil yuri silva hello this content is made from love thanks oh, oh that's nice obrigado oh nice. thank you thank you yuri and uh jesse b styles hello my name is jesse nice to meet you both my question is if you don't know how to write a movie script but you have several movie scripts mapped out in your head from beginning middle to end Hmm. So you have, I guess it sounds like you have the ideas. Uh, would you, what would you advise? Well, would you talk about maybe starting with one? Yeah. 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 Several movie scripts. Yeah. Yeah. Start with, start with one and stick with it. That's, that's the, uh, and it's hard. It's not easy to stick with it, but, um, and also read, read screenplays and watch films like an insatiable sponge. Um, watch them over and over again and just see what the see what the actors are doing see what the directors are doing and then see how you put how can you put that on the page I years ago I used to write um, I, would, I would watch a film and I would write the screenplay as if I was writing it by watching a scene so it almost like just transcribing what it would look like on paper um, just to start to just to start to understand exactly what the um, what it felt like to write a screenplay um, and somebody already wrote it for me and then I can write and then I can just copy it and that's you know I, years ago I used to do that with books too I would just be like oh my god I love this book and I would handwrite the first chapter of the book just to know what it felt like to have a relationship with those words in that way. now for a new writer What's your advice on handing over the first draft or second draft to someone that's not a professional writer, but maybe is close to you? Yeah, I, I, I advise, uh, I advise getting into writers groups or taking classes because then you'll, then you'll be with other writers who are trying to do, who are trying and doing their thing. And that would be more like, more like a peer thing. I feel like if we just show it to friends who aren't writers or necessarily have too much interest in reading in general, if they're not insatiable readers. Uh, it, it could just could put us off, especially in those early stages. We, we want to be looking for our, for our camaraderie and the people who are just as delusional as we are because we think we have this idea that's actually going to work, and then we work on it. We're, we're looking for those people to just kind of be around. <laughs> And then we can go, hey, what do you think of this? Is this a thing? And they can look at it and go, it's not a thing, but here's why I think it's not a thing. And there could be more of a conversation. Oh, great advice. Great advice. 
from primary buffer panel. Hello from Britain. I really should be asleep. Um, can you have several? Ooh, yeah, we can have several. The, <laughs> the, 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 the. Uh, maybe, oh, here we go. Hello, uh, all hydraulics. Hello from Spanish Fort, Alabama. Thank you for sharing your incredible experience and knowledge. Oh, very nice. Uh, hello from Orlando. Hello. Very nice. Um, Michael Martin Dillon. Hello from Toronto. I just got a film through a bunch of film festivals, and I'm wondering how exactly awards are determined. We beat and lose to the same people in different spots. Now, that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, that's good. Um, that's a scary question. <laughs> <laughs> I think you stumped us, Michael Martin Dillon. I think. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know how. I don't know how festivals work with awards. I don't even know how the Oscars work with awards. Yeah, it, it's it's a uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I think there's a marketing department when it comes to the Oscars. Like, isn't there like they put more budget to actually marketing the movie for Oscars than actual production sometimes? So. Sure, and and I'm assuming these are feature. Uh, feature films. Yeah. Referring to. Congrats so, getting them into the film festivals though, and having an audience. Yeah. I wish we had a, a more of an answer, but that's that's an interesting quandary. Yeah. Um, v. Martin, hello from Deep South Texas. When did you realize slash accept? Oh, I like that. Accept that you were a writer. Did you have the conflict deciding between the artistic life and being a quote normie? Okay. Well. I have an we answer. Had this, we actually had this conversation before we started. Yeah. I have an answer to that question. Great. I used to be a normie. I'm still kind of, <laughs> I'm still kind of a normie. Um, I read up. I read. I and I may have said this actually when we interviewed before, but um, there's a book by Newt Hampson called Hunger, and I read that. and And I've been reading for a while, but I've been working also in like tech and things like that, and also doing like college radio. I was kind of like floundering around and when i read that i was, i realized oh man i gotta i gotta i gotta write and that's when i um quit my tech job and mm. started because the tech job was fun but it was life consuming so instead of doing tech i just went and did temp work and was a file clerk or whatever so i could just leave it at work and come home and write um mm. and that's when i that's when i decided that uh, that I'm going to be a writer uh, till the death, and um, and it was a very poor decision, and I should have stayed in tech financially. Now for soul or for for my soul, it was everything I needed to do, and so I feel very lucky. Um, yeah, so just just see just see if it see if um, see if you see if you need to tell your stories not everyone needs to tell their stories uh for me i need to tell my stories it's it's urgent when i wake up in the morning that i have stories in progress and i am so happy that that's my life was there was it building up to many years of you deciding to leave the tech industry or was it a fast exit it's kind of it was i was in it for about two two and a half years it was pretty fast um, and I just realized it wasn't me I do love and that here's the it, um, I love solving problems I love puzzles and you can do that in tech and you can also do that in writing because in writing all we're doing is when our on our first draft we're creating problems we, we're just creating huge problems for ourselves that we need to fix almost like if we were debugging software we need to debug our um, our, our writing to make it better and continue to work on the puzzle, which is that, how do I make this as perfect as I can make it? Mm. That's great. I like that. Uh, primary buffer panels. Okay. Um, here we go. So then hi from Britain. I should be asleep. I write short stories, 70 K words. words. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but always have trouble with philosophical conflicts. My question is we have several, philosophical conflicts or, or will, excuse me, will having several conflicts make the story messy, philosophical conflicts. Isn't 70,000 words more like a novel? Or would it be a novella? Yeah, I think that's hitting okay. close to novel. Uh, okay. Because, I mean, the novel I'm shopping now is like 65,000. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> that clocks in at around like 220 pages or so. But um, philosophical, comp yeah, it's, I, I'm not exactly sure the context of the question, but if it's like philosoph uh, philosophical, con philosophical conflict and like the moral of the story, I feel like honing in on one um, specific, almost a message that you want to get across. There could be other messages throughout the, uh, the work, but one message that's the arc of the, of the entire um, almost a theme. That's that's when the word theme comes in. What is the theme? And the theme, I feel like, needs to have some spe some be spe specific on um, on certain levels. And then that's when we are totally engrossed. And and we may not even want you know a, a regular viewer is not going to walk away and go, I really like the theme of that because they'll just go, I really like that film. I don't understand why I got it, but it's because um the theme was uh was uh hit one one theme i wish i had examples uh but in, oh in, yeah but in, in novels I, I, personally i try to keep it to one and then have little ones in between but those little ones all go to the large the larger central um philosophical moral quandary or something hmm. that's great uh, here we go. Storlack, hello. Do you think that it's important to show an aftermath at the end of the movie to show that the protagonist has really learned his or her lesson? That's good. That's yeah. a great question. We can go back to Little Miss Sunshine on this. Because okay. if you get the DVD, there's actually a longer ending than what was than what came out at the movie theater. They shot an ending that moved that so after they all worked together to get the van working again. And then they jumped in the van and they got on the freeway and then they're on the freeway and then it's like fade out. What a beautiful ending. But they had another scene where they go to a car, where they, they go to like a, one of those rest stops and they're all eating and they're like, man, wasn't that, that was just crazy. Yeah, that was crazy. I'm glad we did that thing. Oh my God, we totally did the thing. And we're together now. This is fun. And um, it's a scene that made it from the beginning script to production to post-production and then was cut so um sometimes not showing the aftermath which would be richard's aftermath and then the family together is more powerful because it already showed it when they when they all just worked on together on getting that band back on the road um and yeah i i'm trying to think of a time of other ones where People learn their lessons, and we get to revel, revel in the joy of them learning their lessons. I can't find any thoughts or examples in my head at the moment. All right. Oh, we have another one. Oh, we'll let you um, pause for a moment. And um, <laughs> I know this is rapid fire for you here, Tony. I'm sorry. We're we're excited and. and Let's, let's, let's give it up for Tony. Yeah, uh, give, give it up for Tony. Tony. Yeah. <laughs> give, give yes. Give yes. Yeah. Hit me. Keep hitting me. Okay, on, here we go. go. I know. It's like it's like a boxing ring. Um, Sangam Saini, hello. Uh, thanks for doing this. My question is, if you have a story where the hero's journey is very emotional, but you personally have never felt that way in your life, then how do you connect with the hero? Great question. Love it. Yeah. Um, what, why I my follow up question would be why would you want to write that story and work on it for a long time? Because um, I mean, you know, there are so many stories that we can write. Why not write the story that emotionally touches us? I, I think that's a writing question, right? Yeah, I guess basically saying, and may, forgive me if I'm assuming here, uh, Sangam. Um, that we're trying to write something that uh, maybe is interesting to us, but we've never actually felt that way. Um, I guess, you know, you can tap into so many different things. I mean, you know, too, you see people out and about in LA. Do you, does that feed your sort of creativity, even though if it's just for one little glimpse and they're ordering a latte and you've already sort of determined what their life is like? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I know we've talked about that before, I think. Yeah, that's fun. Um, 
Yeah, it's yeah. It, I mean, it's and even tapping into characters that we're not emotionally connected with, it's fun to tap into them. I don't feel like I would want to work on a protagonist that I'm not totally emotionally connected with. Um, on some level, uh, and then but the other supporting characters, we don't necessarily have to have the same emotional. Um, uh, the emotional cadence or whatever, or who, you know, of who they are, but understand them from an angle. And we may, you know, it could be someone we don't like, but at the same time, we have to find the empathy because we're working so hard on something. Why would we want to work with something that drives us crazy, even though working just drives us crazy? So that we're already driven crazy. Why not? Why not? <laughs> I guess. And Hunter S. Thompson, he didn't know all of the worlds that. <laughs> He, he eventually wrote about it. He went to sort of inhabit them. I'm yeah. not sure if I advise that for everybody, but yeah, he, he took his own sort of gonzo approach. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, All Hydraulics is writing again. How long have you held on to a bad or stale idea in hopes it will develop? Sometimes six months. Uh, I know, sometimes even longer. <laughs> then, and I tossed them. And I went, wow. And what I and I don't think of those as uh, failures. I think of those as I never want that to see the light of day. And but I learned. I kept going. Um, so that was. Uh, yeah, it's it's continuing the process where I maybe I had to write that in order to get to the next thing that I had to write. Maybe I had to go through that exercise, which is a very positive spin on it. And I don't know where that. Oh, well, I like it. You're channeling your um, inner life coach. <laughs> yes, exactly. Tony giving advice to Tony. So I like it. The nine steps. Uh, let's see, from Art Mish, a question on theme. If there's a movie about stories of three generations of the same family, does the underlying philosophical conflict in all three stories need to be the same for all? Wow, that's great. That is such a great Welcome. question. I wish I had an answer for that. Um, because I guess I don't I don't really connect personally with uh, stories that have like tons of dimension uh, family generations where if it says it on a book flap or it says it on a film, my immediate response is uh, I probably won't watch it. Uh, so I and that doesn't mean that it's bad. It just means that it's something that I don't consume. So that I don't have an answer for. Sure. I mean, I'm thinking of two, like uh, trauma that, that is, is sort of carried on from one generation to the next. So maybe these people are living out the residual trauma. You know, I, I don't know. That's one thought. But yeah. Great, uh, so maybe at, at this stage, um, we can transition to our, our first writing exercise. Yes. Who wants a writing exercise? I do. <laughs> okay. We're going to do a writing exercise. Okay. Let me see which one I have. And thank you to everyone for your questions. And it's, it's great to see everyone in the chat. Yeah, so for a writing exercise, this is, um, here's the thing about writing exercises, especially in this uh, scenario. These are free writing exercises. So you get the rules of the exercise. And then just write. Don't stop writing. And even if you forget the rule, just keep writing. Um, just see what happens. The, the rules aren't as, as important as the continuing of the writing on the paper or on the keyboard. Um, so with our first writing exercise, um, this is the this is the happy moment. Is that, is that right? Yes. <laughs> so there we go. So um, we'll guide you through. A, this will be a two-parter. So uh, name her. What's her name? And usually our gut instinct gives us a name right away. And usually that's the correct name. So, um, and what is she happy about? Don't tell us. That's for my life. That's for my life classes when I'm at the library. I'm like, don't say it. But I want you to find out. I want you to think about, you see her happy. What is she happy about? And then write why she's happy. And just see where the writing takes you. What is, what, does she have a goal that she wants to achieve and she's just so excited about it? And for like seven minutes, just, just dive into this woman that you've already named. You kind of know what she's happy about. Just write 
why she's happy and write this goal that she had that she's just so excited about. Is seven minutes a good idea on that? Maybe three, three to five minutes. Three to five minutes. There we go. Um, so, so yeah, for three minutes. I think it's three minutes. And don't worry about time. Just, just continue to write until we come back, and then we'll have the second part. Okay, we are back. So we have the four questions. What's her name? What is she happy about? And don't tell us. Number three, write why is she happy and see where that takes you. And number four, what is the goal she wants to achieve that she's so excited about? And if, yeah, and if, uh, and then if you feel like there's more, then um, set it aside after this, uh, after you watch this stream and keep playing with it. And then, um, so yeah, um, and now for every protagonist, there's an antagonist. So even if you wrote in an antagonist of sorts, uh, this is uh, this one is monumentally more evil, um, even more twisted. It is so sinister uh, than any other being on Earth. Come up with the name of your antagonist, and let's show the photo of the antagonist they're going to write. Terrible, terrible character. This, this is it. Now remember, the, um, the antagonist is meant to get in the way of our protagonist. And our protagonist is happy. Essentially, she has a goal. And she's so excited about it. So name this antagonist and write about this sinister antagonist and what it does to thwart your protagonist's goals.
through. Okay, so we are back and we'll finish up this exercise and then maybe we'll take a few more uh, questions. And then we have another exercise after that. So we'll do a couple more uh, questions. Thank you to everybody in the chat for your questions and uh, you know, shout outs. Um, okay, here we go. From Video Gamer 65, most of my collabor collaborators are very new to writing. As their mentor and friend, what is a good way to introduce them to writing? What are some good introductory concepts for them? Okay. Yeah. Um, even the free writing exercise that we just did just kind of really gets our head in the game. Um, I feel like, especially when those, when you have rules set and you have a time limit, um, our right brain kind of, our right brain kind of takes over our left brain, and so it's just, oh wow, I got to get this done. So our intellectual side is not going, hey, you don't need to do it that way. You just keep writing. So I guess just keep playing, being playful um, in, in your writing. As writers, though, we need to be reading constantly too, uh, and that's. Um, that's so important because we need to, the conversation can't just be us writing. The conversation is we need to receive as well. So we so we read constantly, we write constantly, and so if they're not insatiable readers, uh, I would you know encourage them to just try to read every day too. Write every day, read every day. It's uh, it's a relationship we want to continue to develop. What do you think about uh, fiction? Uh, through, you know, audio, instead of actually, what if you don't have time to sit down and read, but you can have it playing while you're doing the dishes or something like that? Yeah, I, you know, I must confess, I've never listened to an audio book before. Okay. I, and it's 2023, and that's my problem. But that's okay. um, <laughs> Thank you for your confession, by the way. I, I feel so bad about it. <laughs> but, uh, but I feel like the thing is, it's about the page. So if somebody's going to maybe audio record their stories for a podcast or something, then that would be where you listen to the story. And if, if you, you know, if you need to read, if, if you're at the gym, and you're like, I just want to listen to an audio, great. Um, I listen to certain podcasts and it's uh, mostly from comedians, but I'm not, I'm not out to go do any stand up comedy. But when it comes to like, reading on the page i think it's just that relationship with the page we read on the page we write on the page so continue to keep the eyeballs you know moving in this direction as you read and then they're moving in this direction as you write it's just kind of a brain function okay great another question can, uh, has come in alexandra o'neill hi alexandra how do you write meaningful dialogue yeah that's a good question a lot of that's the point of view of the characters, and also make your characters in conflict. Here, here, here's an example of um, of dialogue where it, say our characters agree with the outcome. So, like our characters might agree with something, which is fine, but being agreeable doesn't make an interesting scene. What makes an interesting scene is how they, how committed they are to their personal point of view of how that outcome is going to play out. So we see this in a lot of like buddy cop movies. We see this in certain films where they all agree that this needs to happen, but they have their hyper focus on how they're going to make it happen. And then you can just develop that dialogue as a tit for tat between these people. Um, and also in rewrites, just pare down the dialogue. It's the early drafts make that dialogue section like this. And then in, if you can get that dialogue down to one line and convey everything you had in that paragraph, that's when it's really tight. And also remember that when we're writing for the screen, we're writing for actors who are going to convey so much just with their facial expressions, with how they've embodied the character. So always remember to try to stay out of the way of the actor. When you can. Mm, that's great. And okay, so primary buffer panel, very fun exercise. Thanks. I think I need to sketch the story out now. Yeah, oh, it's inspiring. It's, yeah, you never know what happens, and it's yeah, it's fun. And uh, Ed Husker four seven three. Should I write the story and then revise it when it's when it was done? Or if if you're talking about the current story, if you want. Uh, the one, the writing exercise, I'm assuming, is uh, the question. Mm -hmm. And if you want, great. And if 
it, if it seems interesting to you and you're like, oh, wait, I can go somewhere with this, dig in. We'll work on it for a week. If you're still digging in, work on it for a month. It may lead you to a different story or it may be a similar story where a, a, a cute little puppy is the antagonist. That would be awesome. It's uh, So, yeah, it, it, find what's find what touches you that you're going to get up to and work on every day. And it, and it may just be this story for a week or two, or this story may be a feature film and you can let us know and tell us where to watch it when it comes out. Great. Uh, let's see. Grim Lord G, would you read old scripts? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. That's always be reading is always, always reading scripts too. Yeah. And it's fun too when to read some of those old old classic films. Right. My uh, students say classic films, they mean Ferris Bueller's Day Off. When I say <laughs> classic films, I mean Billy Wilder. <laughs> uh, let's see. So forgive me if I'm saying your name incorrectly. Uh, Chilumbui, Washington. How many new writers say something about the business of writing, entertainment business industry? I don't hear enough about that. In the business of writing that's a great that's a great question yeah some people are really good at that i don't feel like i'm so good at it that's why i always try to work work my get my work through you know do put my work through the channel of agents and um when you know if they'll have me or other people who can do the business uh even though we do it even though it's a necessary evil to do the business it's um yeah, you know, in a in a perfect world, we uh, we just want to be creative and have people come knocking on our door and go, "What do you have today for us? Thank you, kind of sir." Uh, but it's yeah, I'm not good on the business side of it. I'm trying to be better. Um, so yeah, yeah, maybe that's a, maybe that's something where it's, if you're so right brained, then the left brain is not you know that that like you said, that's why you hire agents and managers because you can do the right brain. And the left brain. Some people, the left brain is no problem. Yeah. It's the right, that's the, you know. Yeah. Um, Andre Wait, hello from Colorado. Uh, can you please go over the first act and the central question? Oh, wow. Yeah. So, I mean, the first act, the story beats are a status quo of our protagonist. So, we see where the who the protagonist is. And we, we talked about um, Rich from uh, Little Miss Sunshine. So we saw his status quo as um, he was just driven. Every, you know, are you going to win? You're a winner. He even tells it to his poor daughter when they're like um, going to go, going to drive to go to the beauty contest. Do you feel like you're going to win? We have a winner, and it's just it's it's so sad. It's and it's his tragedy. So we have his status quo. Then we have the inciting incident. But the inciting incident happens pretty early in Little Miss Sunshine, where they get the phone call that's, hi, she's in the Little Miss Sunshine. So there's our inciting incident. Now, now, what are we going to do? And then all of a sudden, there's all these complications with Blake Snyder and some other um, uh, people who talk a lot about beats. They would call this the debate area. So they're just like, well, my brother just tried to kill himself. He can't be alone. Well, it's, so the so. They scramble around that, and then they go, okay, you know what? Let's go. We're going to do it. So in Little Miss Sunshine, it's kind of like those three beats, status quo, inciting incident, and then it's just the hero goes, ah, no, what, how is this going to work? I, no, no, no. Okay, let's go. And then there's the, that's just the point of no return in doing that, too. Um, as far as the central question, I think it shows up in Act 1. Like If we look at Little Miss Sunshine, the central question is, Here's a dysfunctional family. How are they going to get out of this crazy dysfunction? We and and for people, you know, even I had to watch it a couple of times to realize Richard was the protagonist. And um, so we just see a crazy dysfunctional family, and the question is, well, okay, let, we're on for the ride because boy, those characters are really interesting. And the filmmaker and the writers and the actors they make that happen so fast. We're we're, we're on board. I'm on board with every character, especially Grandpa snorting heroin. It's just <laughs> and his first scene is snorting Alan Arkin snorting heroin. Um, you could just that could be the whole the film could have tanked, and I would have paid fifteen dollars just to see that. 
Yeah, Al Alan Arkin does not do bad character. <laughs> He's awesome. Um, Ed Husker, 473. I know some of my story's plot points, but I couldn't connect them. How to deal with this? Hmm. Yeah, um, keep playing. I mean, that's that's the that's the puzzle part. That's the fun. That's that's kind of the um, you know we, we're create we're we're kind of like magicians. We're creating the sleight of hand. How how we think about a magician who's doing a card trick? They're practicing over and over and over again, so they have a sleight of hand. And then it seems like nothing when they do it, but they've worked on it for months and months and months. So that's when we just try to keep throwing darts at the board and go, how, how do we put this together? And at some point, maybe it doesn't work together. Or at some point, we have that epiphany after working and working and working. We're going, oh, that's, that's how it's together. I should have known that two years ago. Great. Right. I think we're going to do one last question and we'll go into the uh, writing exercise again. And we, uh, Yuri Silva from Brazil is back. Uh, when I write, I didn't create the character. It's like I discovered him. I feel what he feels and I see what he sees. How to combine his experience slash improvisation. Uh, sorry. Now, now I'm <laughs> improvisation, excuse me, with planning. <laughs> You're keeping me on my toes, Yuri. Thank here's, you. Here's some <laughs> Oh, um, yeah. The um, it's I, I I like your process, and then that's I mean it's kind of probably my closer to my process, and then we start to plan. It's usually I'll do a couple of drafts before I really start outlining, because I'm finding the character, and so that's important to me. And then I go, wait a second, okay, now the character needs to do this and this and this. I have to get here to here to here. And I maybe not I may not even know the ending. I might not know the ending for a year. And then usually, if I'm working on it every day, the ending just comes to me. And I'm like, and if this and this happened on this um, last book where I was like, I wrote the ending in this like crazy fever pitch, and I'm like, I have no idea how I'm getting to this, but this is the end. And it took me about another year to get to that end and it's just, and it stayed the end. It's just so strange. And that's kind of, that's the beauty of um, being a writer and just kind of sticking with it and just going, I don't know where this came from, but let's go. Whatever our brains do in there, when we keep showing up, they, they keep showing up and we get a little help. Awesome. And for those of you who did have questions that we didn't get to uh, our apologies, um, so many great ones, and it's great to see so many people uh, come out for this. So thank you. Uh, we're going to go to the last part of our um, uh, live stream today, which is the last writing exercise. And um, this is one you do with a lot of your students as well, Tony. Yeah, I I just did this at the at the library workshop I do in Los Feliz uh, once a month, and. Um, so yeah, so part one is to draw a self-portrait of yourself without looking at the paper. Look into a mirror or, or your phone on selfie mode. Make sure to draw as fast as possible and as a real likeness as possible without looking at the pen or paper. Dare to make mistakes, dare to be awful. We're writers, we're not artists. And then when you're done with that, title it. I'll go with this, I'll do this one as well. Um, so I'll look at the monitor and try to do a likeness of me without looking at the page. And then you can see just how terrible your drawing, how terrible my drawing is and how much better you'll feel about you.
Okay, great. And we are back. And Tony, would you do us the honor of showing your self-portrait? This is amazing. I haven't even looked at it yet. So let me see if I can. Oh, it oh. there we go. Oh, wow. There it is. Oh, very cool. Actually, that's better than I thought it would be. <laughs> and what's the title? Oh, what's the title? The title is Goon in a Room. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. And, and. And here, yeah. Goon in a Room. Okay. Goon in a room is the title. All right. Thank you. Excellent. So after you draw that photo, what we're going to do is we're going to explore point of view. Uh, so you drew this photo. Now this photo is going, this, this art piece, this fabulous creative thing you've just done, um, the New York Met, has actually realized what a genius you are. So they're hanging this sketch next to all the great paintings of the world. And the first character you're gonna work on is an art critic. And from their point of view, the first art critic hates this. <laughs> um, and it has a lot to say about it. Think of someone in your real life, if you want to, that you don't like, and kind of just picture them as the art critic, disgusted that you're, this artwork is, this is, the New York Met thinks it is a masterpiece, right from the point of view of this person, give them a name, and just dive into how bad this artwork is. And that'll be 30 minutes. I, know, I don't know how much time. <laughs> Like this, part, this, yeah, part, this part, this part, this part, I'm not going to go. About five, about five minutes, three, three to five minutes. Okay, and we're back. So we have this art critic, and is this art critic writing like a, their own uh, a piece on, on how horrible? Yes, yes. So you've written this part of the art critic that is disgusted that this that what you just drew is at the uh, Met. It's considered a masterpiece. Mm -hmm. It hangs in the gallery. Now, for the, now, there's another point of view of this, and this will be the art critic that loves this and sees the absolute genius in this work. So 
um, yeah, really dive into this other art critic and give him a name. Think maybe it's a, it could be based on a friend or someone in your life. Just give him a name and let that and just dive into this critic gushing over this artist. What brilliant it is to hang it at the Met. Of course, it's there. This is everything that the culture needs. About what three to three to five minutes? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we're back, back a little bit early. I know we said seven minutes, um, but it might be late for some of you, so. <laughs> uh, so this this is the, the nice critic who, who sees your genius and uh, wants to tell the world about you. And it's and it's a beautiful lesson in uh, just two different points of view, which um, is fun to do. When I, when I, when I assign this to uh, classes, usually, um, people have a lot more ease with the critic that's terrible about it, and they and they feel really uncomfortable writing that the drawing is good, which says so a lot. It says so much about our um, our ourselves because it's hard to compliment ourselves, and it's so much easier to criticize ourselves. Yeah, and it's hard to take compliments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's really interesting. Yeah. Well, last but not least, where can we listen to Drinks with Tony? Uh, that's on any uh, podcast where you get it, uh, or drinkswithtony.com, and um, yeah. And what nights do you do your show, or is it different? Uh, it's I, I tape, and then it airs on Thursday night in, San, uh, in Santa Cruz on uh, uh, 101.9 FM, or no, it's the 92.9 FM, KPCR, LP, Santa Cruz. And then, um, yeah, so I just... I, it's just something I've been doing for a very long time. That I just talk to writers, and that makes sense to me. So. Well, very cool. Well, thank you, Tony, for uh, agreeing to come here and and, yes. and try this with us and for sharing your story again. Um, we also have a full interview with you on Film Courage that uh, people can check out. And thank you to all the listeners. Uh, we're 
just so honored that you came out and a, a worldwide audience. And again, sorry to those that we didn't get uh, your questions. Um, hoping to do this again sometime. But thank you for, for being here. And thank you, Tony. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.